Thank you very much, um, Troy, Rick, and, uh, and also to you, Stuart, for uh, comparing the session so, uh, so well. Uh, it's, it's a singular pleasure for me to be able to uh, introduce the next speaker, um, a very old friend of mine, uh, Air Com uh, Air Chief Marshal uh, Sir Mike Wigston. Um, we spent a lot of time on the tornado force together. Uh, we did quite a lot of time working together as well, and it was, uh, it was always super fun. Uh, tornado pilot, operational tours in Iraq, Qatar, Qatar and Afghanistan. Uh, in addition to squadron command, um, Mike also commanded the British forces in Cyprus. Um, and uh, before moving on to becoming ACAS in the, uh, I'm not sure whether it was a great year to be ACAS, but the, the year of RAF 100. Uh, before becoming CAS in 2019, uh, Sir Mike was the Deputy Commander Capability in, uh, in Air Command uh, with responsibility for planning and delivery of all aspects of RAF capability. Uh, this is the closing keynote and then there'll be a Q&A session afterwards um, and uh, Sir Mike is going to talk on the operationalization. Opera no, I can't say it. Over to you, sir. <laughs> It's always risky being introduced by a former boss because you never quite know what they're going to drag out. And, and 2018 and the RAF centenary was, uh, was always going to be career-defining for good or for bad. So I, I wasn't able to join you this morning, unfortunately. I was at the um, state opening of Parliament, and so I've had another of those surreal days in the, the life of the Chief of the Air Staff where I start with medieval pageantry, uh, in the presence of our uh, future king, future kings, and, um, and then end talking about the future, the really relevant future and the future of space, this, uh, this genuinely exciting new domain. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be at the Defence Space Conference once again and to reflect back on how far we've come in the, in the last five years. And I, and I use the five-year time frame because that's... Uh, in the period that I've been closely associated with it. But I'd, pin, I'd pull out in particular the last two years. And when I say how far we've come, I mean the UK Ministry of Defence and by extension Her Majesty's Government. I know that many of you in the room here have dedicated your whole professional careers uh, to the space enterprise and to the defence space enterprise in particular. But I think we would all recognise the step change in approach by this government and the MOD since 2019, with the decision to establish the Space Directorate under Harve Smith, the establishment of UK Space Command, the publication of the National and Defence Space Strategies, a significant uplift in funding for space programmes, and the confirmation of Air Command's responsibility as Space Domain Lead for the MOD. Now, I don't need to remind this audience of our critical dependency on space. We know that our access to space is fundamental to national security and our way of life. And any loss or disruption to our satellite services would have a disastrous effect on people's day-to-day -day lives. Likewise, its contribution to current and future multi-domain military operations is ever more significant and non-discretionary. We've been saying it for many years in conferences like this, and that's why this gathering is so important and why what we've achieved over the last few years is so pleasing. We cannot be complacent, though. Our potential adversaries have not let up in their ambition to disrupt or deny others' ac access to space. Today, space is a far from benign environment with almost daily cyber attacks and dubious sub-threshold activity. China and most recently Russia have tested anti-satellite weapons, recklessly creating debris fields that will linger for decades, posing threats to the satellites and the space system on which the world depends. Russian satellites continually make close approaches to other satellites, as you've just heard from Rick Greenwood rendezvous and proximity operations. It's possibly an indication of espionage activity or possibly rehearsing something much more sinister. And meanwhile, China seeks to become the world's preeminent space power by 2045. And as part of that is developing cyber, electromagnetic and kinetic systems that potentially 
threaten other users in space. Space operations are the new vital high ground for our defense and security, and they are an essential element of our multi-domain integrated force of today. We have seen over the past months, and we are reminded on an almost daily basis of how space-based uh, capabilities have been critical in Ukraine. Maintaining our strategic awareness, being able to predict the next iteration of Russian aggression, and hold the Putin regime to account for its illegal actions, whilst also, also utilizing our space-based ISR to effectively counter incessant and pervasive Russian disinformation. Our commercial colleagues have been busy too, and I applaud what Maxar and Starlink, amongst others, have contributed to Ukraine's existential struggle. So we have to be ready to protect and, if necessary, defend our critical national interests in space. And just as we protect and control the skies, we must protect the security of the space domain, not only for our access to those vital space-based services, but also to protect and enable multi-domain activity by land, sea, air, and cyberspace. And if we don't think and prepare for that today, we won't be ready when the time comes. Just over a year ago, the UK government published the Integrated Review of Security, Defence, Development and Foreign Policy. It was a significant statement of Britain's place in the world and the role of the UK armed forces in that. Last April, before the ink was even dry on the Integrated Review, Russia first threatened military action against Kyiv. It was a chilling foretaste of what we are now seeing unfolding there, the outrageous, unprovoked, and unjustified invasion of a sovereign country in Europe, something that we thought we had consigned to history. The integrated review could not have been more prescient in that regard, with three important themes which recent events have served to underline even further. Firstly, the recognition that in an uncertain and increasingly dangerous world, we faced fast evolving threats to our nation and our allies. Secondly, in this era of strategic competition, the UK must be prepared and able to act globally as a problem solving, burden sharing nation, amplifying our effect through deeper relationships and partnerships. And thirdly, with a £24.1 billion uplift in defence funding announced in November 2020, that the UK government could not be clearer in its view of the integral role of the UK armed forces in protecting and projecting the United Kingdom around the world. Following the integrated review, we published the UK's national space strategy and following that, the defence space strategy. We now have a clear statement of the UK's national mission in space. First and foremost, it is about protecting and defending our national interests in and through space. This includes being able to identify and attribute threats to our space systems and then respond in a proportionate and coordinated way. Secondly, it's to integrate space operations into defence and security multi-domain operations, including the delivery of resilient and assured space services, such as satellite communications or intelligence gathering, which are crucial to our operations, and you, as you heard from Daryl Amerson earlier. And thirdly, it's to develop, upskill and grow our cadre of space experts from across the Navy, Army, Royal Air Force and our civil service, equipping future generations with the skills to face the threats of the future. Our success in the space domain rests in our next generations of UK space operators, whose interest intellect, experience, and professionalism, we must start to develop now. From a UK MOD perspective, we will look to own our own capability, capabilities and lead their development where there is a pressing sovereign advantage to do so. We will collaborate wherever we can, from projects with our lead ally, the United States, all the way through to supporting the UK Space Agency's UK space launch programs and we will assure access to the shared resources of our like-minded allies and coalition partners. As a global commons, space has always been a place of collaboration internationally 
and with civilian and commercial partners as well as military. In making space safer and secure, what is certain to us all is that none of us can do this alone. The challenges facing us are of such a scale that it makes eminent sense for us to work ever closer and to do this together. Which is why we must develop and generate space capabilities that contribute effectively to the defence and security ambitions of ourselves and our allies and partners. And many of our closest international partners are on the same journey to our immense collective benefit. The French Space Command was established in 2019 and Italy formed its Space Operations Command that same year. Japan stood up its Space Operations Squadron in May 2020, Germany its Space Command in July last year. NATO has established a Space Centre of Excellence and tasked NATO Air Command Ramstein to command and control NATO's space mission. More recently, Australia formed its Defence Space Command in March, with Canada's Space Division being created later this year. The UK is one of the founding members of the Combined Space Operations Initiative, the common vision which we agreed between our nations in February 2022 signals our commitment over the next decade to accelerating and improving our cooperation, coordination and interoperability, sustaining our freedom of action in space, optimising our shared resources and enhancing our shared resilience. The UK was the first partner to join Operation Olympic Defender, the US-led International Space Coalition. We joined in December 2019 and we recently celebrated the first anniversary of the UK-Australia Space Bridge. That space bridge has enhanced and accelerated cooperation between our two space sectors, from sharing Earth observation data to collaborating on robotics and artificial intelligence. This world first has also generated increased access to trade, investment and academic research opportunities, as well as stimulating innovative bilateral collaboration. In the United Nations, the UK will continue to lead efforts to establish agreement on norms and rules of responsible behaviour in space. In 2020, the UN General Assembly First Committee voted in favour of a UK resolution on reducing space threats through norms, rules and principles of responsible behaviours. And that important work is continuing under UK sponsorship through the UN Open-Ended Working Group. Along with like-minded allies, we will continue to call out irresponsible and reckless activity in space wherever we see it, such as the destructive testing by Russia last year of one of its legacy satellites. And in contrast to that Russian recklessness, the US recently became the first country to ban destructive anti-satellite missile tests in an effort to protect Earth's orbit from such dangerous space debris. In this case, the United States has taken the lead in shaping responsible international behavior, something that we, needless to say, fully support. This morning began with the perspective from the MOD, policy and political leadership. And I'm sure you got a crystal clear sense from Minister Quinn of this government's ambition and determination to deliver against the national and defence space strategies. And I do give great credit to the personal drive of the pr Prime Minister behind that. You also heard from the Minister about the exciting plans for the launch of Prometheus 2 from the UK this summer. It's exciting in every sense, from our collaboration with Virgin Orbit, to the payload collaboration between InSpace, DSTL and the National Reconnaissance Office. And it's exciting for what we will learn in the Royal Air Force, UK Space Command and UK Defence about responsive launch. The conference programme then got operational with my good friend Jim Dickinson, demonstrating the leadership we frankly need from the United States, but also that clear sense and growing willingness to collaborate across the most, this most challenging domain. You also heard from Paul Godfrey about UK Space Command, from our international partners and our commercial partners, and the deep dive into space domain awareness. 
But I know from talking to many of you this afternoon that hearing from Vlad and uh, about the space's role in the fight for Ukraine and what we all must learn from that were amongst today's most memorable moments. Looking forward to tomorrow's conference agenda, we start the day with a science and technology focus with Alex Van Sommeren, our Chief Scientific Advisor for National Security, and Michael Callahan from DSTL, including a focused look at the MOD's space research programme. Panels and presentations throughout tomorrow will explore the importance of supporting innovation and growth through ever closer cooperation with our academic partners and the UK and international space industry, and how collectively we can continue to ignite the sparks of inspiration within our next generations of space technicians and space operators. And last but not least, the conference will close tomorrow with the outgoing Deputy Chief of the Defence Staff for Military Capability, Air Marshal Rich Knighton, and the MOD's Second Permanent Secretary, Mr Lawrence Lee, talking about the UK MOD's approach to current and future space capability. I'd like to take this opportunity with the microphone to thank every one of our excellent speakers and panel members today and in advance of tomorrow who have contributed towards making our Defence Space Conference such a success. And, and including in that, I would, uh, I would call out all of those people behind the scenes who have made it happen, and particularly Roberto from the Air and Space Power Association. So thank you for your partnership in this. Space is critical to the day-to-day -day lives of every citizen in the UK and of our allies. Everything that makes our lives secure, comfortable and efficient is reliant on space. Likewise, its contribution to current and future multi-domain military operations is ever more significant and non-discretionary. In that context, the ambition and direction from the UK government is clear. The space sector is important to the nation and we must be at the forefront of the explosion of technological and commercial opportunities in space. The UK Armed Forces must be radically forward-looking to be able to pr protect and promote the UK's interests in space and make a leading edge contribution to the coalition of like-minded nations and organisations that have come together to ensure that space is there for the benefit of all. Thank you. And I now look forward to the, the panel discussion uh, where we can uh, discuss uh, this important uh, domain uh, further for the, to, to, to close the day off. Thank you. Just before we get into questions, I would like to just introduce Natalie Moore, um, who is uh, the head of space policy in the Space Directorate. Uh, Natalie has been around defence, I think, since 2004, 2008, Correct. 2004, um, and uh, uh, spent time in a variety of different, uh, fairly high profile things, actually, Defence Digital, the Baha Musa Public Inquiry. Uh, she spent time at Army HQ um, and spent time also with the MOD FCDO Stabilisation Unit. Then moved to the defence team, uh, to head the defence team in the Cabinet Office, um, and that was involved in delivering both the integrated review and the subsequent defence command paper. Thank you very much for being on the stage, and uh, we'll open the, question, the floor to questions, please. One at the back. Yes, please. Otherwise, you can get open one of my questions, and they're particularly banal. Thank you, Larissa Brown from the, the Times. A uh, couple of questions for Kaz. I'm just uh, wondering. You've obviously got a lot of aircraft involved in the war in Ukraine at the moment, either you know flying in weapons or intercepting communications, and. I'm sure you'll tell us this. I'm wondering whether you've whether they've had any um, sort of interference from Russian aircraft at all. We we had that report last year about aircraft taking off from Cyprus facing um, uh, communication issues as a result of uh, Russian attacks. Um, and secondly, are you developing any defensive capabilities that would be able to uh, defend against Chinese and Russian attacks in space? Thank you. 
So to the, the first part of your question, uh, it would be, um, I, I think, both for the civil aviation sector, before we even get into uh, NATO operational activity, that the, the NOTAM, the, 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 you know, the notice to airmen that has been placed over the Ukraine uh, conflict area, so it recognises the significant disruption and interruption to uh, GPS and navigational systems, similar to what we have seen and, and the NOTAM that's still in place around areas of conflict in the Middle East, like Syria. So it's a, uh, you know, so it's a, uh, you know, it's a, um, you know, a, uh, a live issue, a, a, an operating hazard, and it's causing uh, you know, significant disruption for the civil aviation sector. In terms of uh, direct um, disruption of air activity, um, and I speak for the Royal Air Force and as far as I'm aware for our 29 other NATO partners, we, we have not seen that, that uh, uh, disruption uh, right from the start of the invasion of Ukraine. The air forces, NATO air forces were ready. We were the first line of defense for, for NATO nations and we were there to ensure that the, uh, the conflict did not escalate or expand. And, uh, you know, and it was, uh, there was a plan led by NATO Air Command in Rammstein, which was executed flawlessly by uh, countless um, uh, air crews and um, support staff from across the, the NATO alliance. For your, um, to, to your uh, second question, right now we have to... And I think the, the panel discussion before I spoke about space domain awareness, our number one priority is understanding what is going on in space and having a much clearer view, much deeper into space, all the way to the geostationary orbit of, uh, of what is going on and what you know, potential adversaries, frankly, are up to and where our most precious critical national infrastructure might be at risk. When we have a better understanding of that downstream, we, we might need to take different measures to protect and defend our, uh, our satellites. But I, I, wouldn't, uh, I would ask that you don't leap to the conclusion that in saying that I'm talking about uh, you know, we weaponizing space in some way. You know, one of the most effective ways of, uh, of protecting and defending our critical assets in space is to make them resilient and uh, working with international partners, with like-minded allies, to make sure that actually the effort of, inter they're so resilient, resilient and operational resilient that the, the effort that a country like Russia or China might go to to disrupt a satellite is, is not worth the effort because we can just reconfigure the system and replace. And that's, that's the importance of, of the work that's going on un under United States leadership unquestionably, but um, that, uh, you know, that um, massive ex expansion in the, collaborative opportunities between like-minded allies. Okay. So, well, you, we'll, we'll stay in the room. Yeah, Roberto. I was just going to add Sorry, a point. Okay. Add a point to that. Only that um, integrated deterrence has come up a lot today. It's a sort of it's the it's the phrase of the moment, and and just talking about space threats and the value of um, space domain awareness. Because we've talked a lot about integrated deterrence, but fundamentally, um, for any deterrence strategy to be effective, you have to be really, really clear what you're trying to deter. And fundamentally, to that fundamental to that is understanding what is out there, what are the threats, what are you looking at, being able to understand your adversary in in quite some detail. So I just wanted to pull it sort of link those two themes together and say that from a space perspective, integrated deterrence is is really critical because we're not necessarily t talking about, um, as the motion says, I'm not necessarily talking about a symmetrical response in the space domain. We're talking about looking across the spectrum to say, yeah. how can we deter those threats? But first, we need to understand them. What is um, just to add, Natalie touches on a, a really important point. I mentioned earlier on about the ground link and orbit segment. So when it comes to that protect and defend mission, it's easy to go straight into uh, the space domain. But there's a cyber domain awareness that is required. There's a physical domain awareness that's required in order to protect the ground infrastructure and the computer infrastructure that is, uh, is required to do this. And certainly I'd uh, echo Kaz's point on the, the space domain awareness aspect. Right now, that's my number one um, priority 
Um, I've often used the analogy, you would not put an aircraft carrier, as an example, into an operational domain without first understanding that domain, and secondly, being able to do something about it. So we've got a journey ahead of us, but it is about that space domain awareness and the other um, aspects of this as well. Thank you. And this is a question that was actually asked of um, General Dickinson earlier, and I think it's, uh, it's a good one. Uh, has the war in Ukraine changed any of our strategies? Space. It's, it's very early days. Uh, it has, uh, as I said in my sort of, uh, remarks earlier, it has um, already, to our mind, absolutely underlined the, the conclusions and the headline conclusions of the integrated review. And, um, and it's reinforced some of what we know and what we, um, you know, and what we understand about the importance of, of space. I think that point I made as well about some of the agility that we've seen from some of our commercial partners in a way that um, you know, we would be you know, surprising to us if it, not, if it wasn't for some of the agility that some of our intelligence partners have also shown over the last two months has, has, shown, has shown how significant and, and important the, uh, the Earth observation uh, and the communications element of, uh, of what we do you know, by, with, and through space is. So it's a, uh, you know, it, we will be studying and understanding the, the Ukraine the campaign for and the compl Ukraine war for, for many years, I suspect. Uh, it's very early to draw specific conclusions, but everything points them to them reinforcing what we knew and um, and going you know and going forward on on that basis Absolutely. to that i mean i was um, i've been involved in writing all three of the strategies that have been talked about today so i am quite attached to them and it's, <laughs> it's been a busy year but um uh, i mean i agree completely with that it seems to have um reinforced the key principles of those strategies with russia as the acute threat as um highlighted in the integrated um integrated review i think one of the things that emphasizes for me um and building on um Kaz's point is the need to educate about space um, not just educate within defense not just educate across government uh, with parliament um but to really um sort of ram home the value of space as an integrator because i think um potentially to the uninitiated the, the ukraine conflict does does point to a reliance on conventional forces and conventional capabilities. And, and we need to sort of make sure we draw out the, um, the points that we've been making throughout today on the value of space as integrating across the, across the piece and particularly the um, Earth observation ISR um, angle, um, as you say. I think um, also for me, as we, as we move into sort of implementing the national space strategy and looking at um, you know, how we work with, the, with you as the space sector um, on, on delivering that, um, it does, put particular emphasis on the own collaborate access model and particularly that access element. Again, we've touched on it throughout today, but I think maybe it has slightly shifted the dial from where we were pre-Ukraine on sort of thinking about the, the value of access um, for the reasons that you've just highlighted. Um, I, for me, there's a couple of things. One, uh, you know, from a UK Space Command, from a Space Commander perspective, it's how do we bring the lessons together? Um, Harv and I spoke very early on when this started to understand um, exactly what, what are we going to learn from this conflict. Um, we talked a lot of collaboration with our international colleagues in the room uh, here today and, and how we come together to discuss that because um, I, I think Natalie just said, you know, it, it, the dial has shifted, but it would be wrong to pivot all of a sudden to that's it, we're going to access everything. You know, so we still need to continue with our uh, capability demonstrators and understand that what we can bring in that own factor um, and where we can collaborate with our, with our international partners. Um, so I think you know, over the last 30 years, I think all of us have a, a slight reticence to jump to conclusions, but I do think there are some big lessons that we can learn from this. It's how we bring them together for the whole community. And in that multi-domain era, it's not just in stovepipes and in individual domains. It's about how it affects all of us, as, uh, as Natalie has just said. Thank you. Sorry, there was one over there. Uh, Neil Fraser from NSSL Global. So I was at one of the many um, space conferences a, a month ago on military disruptive space, and Will Whitehorn, who's the president of UK Space, quoted some interesting figures from the uh, size and shape of the industry thing, um, which was that 83% of revenue to private companies um, 
is private in the UK, so 83% revenue, which is the highest international figure, apparently. Um, but government spending is 10th in the world as a percentage of GDP, which is a relatively low figure. Um, so there's a good news story in, in that innovation and export and R&D in the private sector in the UK is really healthy. The less good news story is, you know, we're a victim of our budget. Um, it's fantastic, we've got an extra 1.4 billion thrown at defence, uh, which is great. So I guess the question is, A, is there likely to be more money in another round? Answer, likely no. Uh, B, is there likely to be a bit more veer and haul within bounds um, when um, all the space money uh, sits in High Wycombe? Question. Yeah, um, so I, I think and uh, that, that will certainly be a good question to ask uh, Rich Knighton tomorrow as well, um, because, um, uh, and, and not least to, to sort of cross-reference and see if he says the same as me, but we absolutely looked at the settlement from the Integrated Review for Space as a, as a start -up starting point. And I think those of you that have been in this game for a long time will have, will have, will have recognised that Stanfast Skynet, that, that 1.5 billion was a, you know, was, was, was a you know, groundbreaking in terms of a clear statement of intent around the space portfolio. But the challenge, you know, the challenge that we had with when you are dealing with taxpayers' money and the Treasury is you, 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 you can't just go in and say, I'd like three billion pounds. I don't quite know how I'm gonna spend it and I haven't really got any programs, but let, just give me the three billion and it'll be fine. You know, we, 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 we had to, we, you have to start with a, with a plan and a programme, and you've heard from Goddard's around things like the Minerva programme, Prometheus and, and, and the like. Um, so it's, it's, it's starting with those, with those small steps, but I am absolutely convinced that it will be, you know, the arrow is only going to be going in one direction. And as Goddard's takes greater responsibility for the, um, the across the whole space portfolio, in, including the you know the Skynet elements, as his capability team grows and matures in that space, are um, you know that there will be no no limit to our ambition nor our ability to, um, to to make the case to the Ministry of Defence and the Treasury for greater funding. So, so I do see that as a you know, as an important, you know, and, you know as I say, the, the direction only going in one, you know, one way. But that is just defence spending, and we've just got to recognise where, you know, the, the, this government's clear intent across all sectors, and, you know, science, scientific, commercial, and, and in defence. To your, to your second question, it, it, it gets into the sort of, the, the, the um, intricacies of uh, departmental funding, but, but I'm very clear in my mind that, uh, that I'm treating Space Command as, in some respects, a sub-unified command of my budget. So I'm, 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 and in fact, God, as you mentioned earlier, I will delegate, I am delegating this year to God as in entirety a, a ring-fenced amount. And that's how I anticipate continuing into the future. I, 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 I give... Um, you know, full authority for Goddard to veer and haul across his growing space portfolio, but I don't uh, an anticipate any time soon having you know having any any requirement or desire for me to to move um, funding across the air and space boundary. That's a decision that's made in head office at the major set, you know, uh, financial settlement points. Sorry if that got into a little bit too much. Whitehall grocery shopping. <laughs> um, from my perspective, just uh, that final point, Neil, you, you made about all the money sitting in High Wycombe. Actually, we've talked about this team being a team game. What we haven't, and I think we'll get maybe a bit more into it tomorrow, um, looked at is you, I mentioned the uh, collaboration with the UK Space Agency, for example, and one person's ISR is another person's Earth observation. So the dual use aspect and sort of combining the relevant areas of the Bayes budget on this side of things enhances that side of it. And uh, certainly Minister Freeman, um, at the launch of the National Space Strategy, talked about industry then contributing and, and actually sort of supercharging um, the, uh, the space environment there. And, and actually, so when you look at the amount of money as well, you know, probably looking at uh, Chris Gardner with the... Um, 
the stand-up with the Australian Space Command, the, the fact that with JP9102, the satellite communications and the, the sorts of things they are looking to get at, so the money is very, very similar um, on that side of things. So I think you'll find that all the, the sort of uh, allied and partner nations are starting in the, uh, in the way that, uh, that Kaz uh, has mentioned. I did a, a very quick calculation, but um, you know, Space Force got a annual budget this year of 25 billion um, in order to get at these things. And actually, um, we're about 25 times smaller than Space Force. And when you average out seven billion pounds, $10 billion over 10 years, that does actually come to about a billion dollars a year for us. So the ratio is kind of correct uh, at the moment. No, sandwiches, they really stolen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, just a slightly different direction there, which is a uh, question that's come in online. Um, lots of discussion today about military and commercial working together. So the fundamental question is, do you see any dangers in the direct commercial involvement in conflict, and how would you solve it? Yeah, that's um, yeah. That that is a uh, yeah. That 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 is a challenge, but in many respects and in other parts of defence, um, particularly in engineering, technical support, um, advanced, you know, forward technical support, we're all, we're already there, and 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 recognising too that when you're up against a you know ruthless, brutal adversary like Russia it doesn't matter what what you've got on your you know on your polo shirt they don't distinguish between schools uh, you know theatres and mili military barracks and so for them the distinction between uh, you know a, a, a military operator or a commercial operator I'm sure is equally indistinguishable uh, you just have to recognize the nature of the adversary you're up against with a with a country like like Russia I but, but taking one step away from Russia, I don't see what we're doing in space with that partnership and that, you know, some of those dual use um, capabilities that we're talking about actually as any, as philosophically as any different to some of the things we're doing in the land, sea, air or cyberspace environments. Um, I, I would com Completely agree with all of that. The uh, you know through Afghanistan uh, over recent years, the commercial companies have been on the front line, operating um, you know uh, various bits of kit and, and helping out uh, through the way. The I think it was alluded to this morning actually in, in um, it was Sean's question, but the, I mentioned in my speech the uh, about the commercial integration cell, uh, uh, and whilst it is currently Satcom companies that share information with us and we share information with them, then I think the discussion today, is, and it was something we were looking at already, in terms of those owner operators of other capabilities, it will be about information sharing so that uh, you know, we can give them the, uh, the information that we know and, and vice versa. So I think that is a, a thread that we need to pull um, and are looking at uh, as we look to expand the commercial integration. So I know from uh, General Dickinson and Spacecom uh, their commercial integration cell is looking at the same thing. And it is a conversation we've had amongst the CSPO nations about how we do this collectively uh, as well. So um, I think it comes back to that space domain awareness and understanding this for everyone that is out there doing good uh, for the world. All from the floor. Howard, come back to you. Thank you for looking to your right, <laughs> Howard Wilden. Um, given the huge change that defence, UK defence, has gone through in the last 10 years, or even just come back to the last five, do we have sufficient numbers of the high-level skills in the MOD and indeed in the upper echelons of the Royal Air Force uh, to actually achieve the ambitions we've set? Are you talking from a um, space perspective there, Howard? I'm talking from uh, across the board, the, amb the ambition set in IR. Yeah. Well, um, in, in, in terms of the, those high-end skills, the expertise, I, I would be the first to say, you know, say it is one of our strategic risks. And making sure that we are able to continue to tap into the, 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 the full pool of talent and potential in the UK workforce 
attract it, recruit and, and sustain it, and then take advantage of what is there in the commercial sector, across government. This, this is absolutely a challenge, and I, I do, but I don't think it's a challenge for just the UK Armed Forces. I think it's a challenge for any technical organisation that, that I know of in the UK. It's, uh, you know, and that is why you know, we saw some of them today from Northrop Grumman, but I know everybody uh, you know, from industry in this room is involved in the STEM programme in one way or another, as we are. That, you know, we, we undoubtedly face a, a future shortfall of those skilled science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and in particular, sort of the, the digital skills, and we have to bring on that next generation. In terms of the here and now, we, we have got the people we need, but I know that it, you know, it, is a, you know, it is something that I am absolutely alive to, the, you know, that, I, that what I, I don't want to do is hand to my successors over the next kind of decades a, an organisation which is set up to struggle or set up to fail because we haven't ensured that the, the talent, and particularly with a base-fed organisation like the Armed Forces, that the talent isn't coming through the organisation. You know, the, 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 you know the, the, the return of service in the United Kingdom now, is, uh, sorry, in the Royal Air Force, is, uh, is close to 20 years. It's sort of 16, 17 years, and it's over 20 years for officers. So these are people that work their way up through the organisation. So it's you know, that, that future success, that future skill base, skills base, you know, we really need to look at that talent pipeline. I just add from a um, from a space perspective, um, being very involved in the implementation of the national space strategy, and one of the work streams underpinning that implementation plan is on skills. And, and so, on, from a space perspective, we're taking a very um, joined up cross government approach to looking at the skills problem across across the, across the sector and and within government. And um, Goddard might have a bit more to say on that as that sits firmly in in space command, but very much recognised in the national space strategy as an issue. It's a very productive workforce, the space workforce, and um, we want to sort of keep it that way and um, make sure we, uh, we build the skills base across, across the sector and, and, and government. Yeah, um, for those of you in here, I, there was a, an answer a very similar, uh, to a very similar question earlier. Uh, on this front, we've got uh, Air Commander Mark Fluin, who's, uh, who's sat over there, a 20-year uh, uh, you know, fighter pilot who I've never seen so excited about the ability to get his teeth into the um, uh, the upskill and cohere aspect of the, uh, of the national space strategy. Um, this, as I talked about with partnering and so on, there's so many opportunities out there to bring the right people in. We've just got to break the mold in certain areas. And, and one of the really fortunate things for us is that we've had the cyber domain just ahead of us on this, looking at unified career models, looking at zigzag uh, career paths where people go out to industry, come back again, looking at uh, lateral entry into the organizations. Um, and we are going to have to do that, Howard, uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to it, because in order to just to grow this workforce and have that, the, from a space perspective, the, the right specialization. So it is a really interesting and fascinating part of what we're doing. Um, and certainly, just purely from a defense perspective, I see it here as the Training Requirements Authority, which means it is my job, I'm responsible for defense to ensure that the whole of defense gets up to a level of awareness um, just a working knowledge of space so that um, you know, they understand the importance of space or how space might help to solve a problem later on in their career. Thanks. Uh, Tony Oswald with Aviation Week. A sort of two-part question, if I may. Um, Chief of the Hour staff mentioned responsive uh, capability would be tested or you know, lessons learned from uh, Prometheus too. So... How, what, what is defined as responsive for the Space Command going forward? Is that keeping a bunch of satellites in crates? And how responsive can you be if you're dependent on commercial launch? How responsive is commercial launch? Yeah, it's a great question, which is why, and it wasn't a plan, but, uh, and the Chief of the Air Staff mentioned it, but um, in this summer at the Virgin Orbit launch, and uh, we're lucky that we've, uh, we've got a test pilot um, who will hopefully be uh, the... Uh, uh, be a very central part of that. Um, but we've teamed up with Virgin Orbit the Aerospace Warfare Center to look at, uh, to build a trial around that responsive, uh, to look at responsive launch. And with the trial, looking at what is required, um, you know, transport of stuff around the world, the, uh, you know, just the cost 
of doing things to determine whether it is a requirement for us in the future. I can't sit here now and tell you that responsive launch is a, uh, is a requirement, but it was interesting to hear Vlad really hammer that point in terms of the, the loss of space launch. Um, so I think there are some really exciting opportunities um, through the CSPO nations. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we're happy, we've offered that we will um, put observers on, um, share the data on this, because I think this will uh, benefit all of us in understanding exactly what you need to do. And you know, you make a point there about hangars full of, uh, of spacecraft or, or satellites or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, I, I think more and more we're seeing with, with new space that uh, it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So um, you know, the ability to do that in the future isn't as far-fetched as it would be. And I think uh, companies like uh, Virgin are, uh, are definitely leading the way on this. So I think we will know a lot more post-summer um, once we've done this trial. Yeah, the, the theory tells us that it's worth doing. But, uh, and, that, and, that's, and that goes back to that point about the resilience it op offers us, the choice, the operational choice to, you know, to throw up a, you know, satellite, satellites for a particular operation at a particular time. Um, so I'm all in favour of us doing this, uh, you know, this trial as part of the Prometheus launch so that we can better understand it because... Um, we, we don't know uh, what the you know what the challenges are, what the pitfalls are. We're we're on the same journey as other uh, other allies in this, and doing an end-to-end -end test of what it would take to do a responsive launch, albeit through a you know, through a very um, you know, uh, uh, scripted trial, is still um, you know, we will still learn a huge amount. Great. Well, with deference to the atmosphere in this room and the fact there are a rather large number of ice cold drinks out there, I think we'll probably draw stumps now. Um, I'm supposed to give a five minute uh, rundown of the day. Um, uh, so Mike has done that already, so I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to have one, one thought that's occurred to me as the day has gone on. And I, I've done a lot of these conferences, as many of you have as well. There's a role for everybody in the room in this journey which is quite unusual. Um, if you're in academia, we need to be training. If you're in industry, there's a whole world of stuff that needs to be done out there. If you're an ally, lots of discussion about that today. So it, it, it's just struck me that we are really one team. And that I can't think of any other conference that I've been to where you could, I can genuinely feel that. If you disagree with me, come and have a, a word over a drink. But well, that's the way it feels to me. It's very much a, a, a whole team effort, and that's really good. So that's my thought. The, uh, a couple of things that I need to do. There is a reception on now. Um, well, immediately we leave here. Uh, for those of you that are going to the gala dinner, that's 1900, and it's upstairs, uh, but you'll be directed. I need to uh, please um, uh, pass on my sincere thanks to all the speakers today. We've had some really, really great sessions today, um, and, uh, and that is super. One of the things that I always forget to do, but I haven't forgotten this time, is to thank the sponsors and partners that we have, without whom this just does not happen. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, enjoy the evening, and please uh, say thank you uh, with me to the uh, excellent panel that we've just had. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs>